Okay, so um, this is my first case. This is a 40 year old female with this pelvic MRI. Wondering what you guys think. Not an eye test. Um, it, I think it's cervical or is it endocervical? No, it looks look cervical. A bit centered in the cervix, I think. Yes, exactly. And then mets everywhere. I mean, lymph node metastasis and local extension. Exactly. So this is a large kind of um, fungating cervical mass, cervical cancer. Um, so I have three cervical cases. I just wanted to show them kind of back to back. This one is a typical cervical cancer. 90% um, of them are going to be squamous cell and affiliated with HPV infection. So the incidence is decreasing now that there is an HPV vaccine, um, but this one is a pretty advanced one. Um, one interesting thing is that when we're staging these, especially by MRI, we are going to be looking for parametrial invasion. Um, so basically invasion into the space around the cervix here. Um, but in this case, actually, most of it is kind of bulging endocervically, and we can still see this T2 dark line along the edge. So um, if, we were, if this was just the mass, I'm not sure. I mean, it's so big that we know that. And it's, it's also larger than four centimeters, which is another um, part of the T-staging. But um, just the fact that we can see this T2 dark line, at least the parts that I see here, I don't see any definite parametrial invasion. Interior looks a little... Um, blurred, like anteriorly, you're saying? Yeah, if you uh, by near the blotter, like right there. Yeah, yeah. That, that looks like there's um, right here. Yeah. 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 Disruption of the parametrium. Yeah. So good. So that would be um like parametrial invasion. So what we're looking for is disruption of this dark um uh, muscular line. Um, in this case, they also have these large um, necrotic nodes. So this was this would be stage three, or um, and then this is kind of like the evil gray of tumor. So 90% um, are squamous cell, and then 10% are going to be adenocarcinoma. Um, they can also cause hydro. In this case, it did not cause hydro. You can actually see the ureters kind of separately over here, um, going by um, the mass. They're not obstructed. So anyway, um, this was just a large cervical cancer because it's above stage 2A, um, the patient is gonna get chemo radiation as, as well as surgery. Um, this is my next case. You can see it's also a cervical mass. Oh, uh, sorry. It's a little slow, but basically it was uh, pretty avidly enhancing. You can see it didn't look kind of as fungating as that last one. It didn't really look like a typical cervical cancer to us. Um, this one also didn't appear to be extending beyond, um, at least most of it was not extending beyond the T2 dark cervical stroma. Any thoughts on what this could be? I'll give you a clue. It's not a squamous or adenocarcinoma of the cervix. And can somebody just read the chat to me? Because I can't see it. Christine um, said prolapse fibroid. Good. That's a great thought. And actually, that is something we were thinking about. Um, we would have liked it to be even like cervical fibroid. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, like if it was even darker, like darker than the muscle, um, we would have definitely felt that this could be a fibroid and we brought up a fibroid. Um, but just, this just happened to be, turned out to be a leiomyosarcoma of the cervix. Wow. So, I don't know how we would be able to clinch that, but I just want to kind of contrast that it does look quite different than that other kind of cervical cancer that it doesn't really have that evil gray infiltrative appearance. It's kind of more of like a round um, pretty avidly enhancing mass has some. Do you have the DWI? Mm -hmm. I should. Let's see. So a lot of restricted diffusion. 
don't know if that helps, but because fibroids can also restrict and, and cervical cancer, I presume that it. I thought like sarcoma or lama sarcoma will restrict more than um, conventional vibrate. But this one was, it was sarcoma, right? You said? Yeah, lama sarcoma. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, just so you know, it exists also in the cervix. Anywhere you have smooth muscle, you can get a lama sarcoma. So, um, and then this is my third cervical case. Um, what do you guys think about this one? Uh, can I ask a quick question about that last case? So um, did you suggest a biopsy to, to diagnose that lab master combo or did they just go ahead and do it because of how indistinct or indeterminate it was? Um, we kind of hedged and basically said, you know, while this could be a fibroid because it has relative, you know, avid enhancement, um, we didn't think it was definitely a fibroid because it wasn't like definitely T2 dark, um, super T2 dark. Um, so we we recommended it. We said it could be either a fibroid or a cancer. We didn't bring up leiomyosarcoma. Um, so it was kind of a surprise to us. It doesn't really look like it's, you know, uh, uterine. Um, so I think it was truly a cervical leiomyosarcoma, but we didn't, it just kind of wasn't on our radar, but just something to think about. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just, to, uh, just a point of that. There, there's also a happy medium, which is the stump tumor. Mm -hmm. uh, where you might not be that worried. I mean, this has a diffusion restriction and it's, but it's still, it's preserving fat planes. It's not, it's not ugly, right? It's not destroying that stoma. Mm -hmm. And so you have that spectrum of stump versus, you know, atypical myoma versus, you know, sarcoma degeneration. And so when you, when you don't, when you're saying it's not adeno, but it's not exactly a typical fibroid, you can go into the round of stump or atypical or, you know, sarcoma degeneration. So there's a lot of them that turn out to be stump at the end um, that don't behave like standard, you know, um, fibroids. And the fact that it's descending the damn cervix all the way down, it's prolapsing through, it, that's, that's another feature of, you know, what carcinosarcoma is like to do too. It, that's the other um, diff. Mm. What do you mean by that? That's a feature of them. Like they like to rather they than like, invade out, they, you're saying? Yeah, they prolapse down. They go oh. down to, and some of them even go through the level of the, like the introvertia. It's something that the GYNs have noted you know, on their exams. That's one of the clinchers of it. They see, they go to, they do a cervical exam. They see a prolapsing through the os. That's the key, the key for carcinosarcoma or the, the former triple MT that we used to call it. Oh, cool. Yeah, and this seems like it'd be such an easy biopsy that I think I'd, even if, I don't know, I, I'd want to biopsy it. So, um, and then this is my last case. That looks like a polyp. Oh, yeah, no. so this was a prolapsing polyp. So just a large polyp with cystic spaces. And actually the pathology was, um, with extensive edema in this polyp. It had a lot of T2 hyperintensity within it. Um, it was prolapsing down. So, um, and then we thought the stock was kind of basically called it in this region here. Um, and it was basically just attached by one little stock and the rest of it was not attached. So they were able to resect it. And I'll show you the post contrast. Um, so polyps, uh, about 50% of polypoid lesions, or 60% will be actual cervical polyps. And only 50% of them are actually symptomatic. So a lot are incidental, not necessarily related to the classic kind of intermenstrual bleeding. And they typically present in um, around uh, 50s. So I think they kind of become more symptomatic in patients 50s after basically as they've grown large enough to kind of be symptomatic. And now maybe the patient has perimenopausal bleeding. Um, so it does have enhancing components to it, but this was just a prolapsing polyp. And then I do have one more case. Um, this was cool. This was a patient who had multiple uh, complex um, renal lesions. Some were simple cysts, some were proteinaceous or hemorrhagic cysts. And they had this um, more solid enhancing mass in their interpolar left kidney. 
So uh, they decided to ablate it. They did cryo ablation. And this was the, um, I think this was a couple of months after cryoablation. This was actually uh, six months after cryoablation. This is what the site looked like. And then another six months later, it looked like this. So what do you guys think? I don't like the tissue growth, but it's kind of fast for our recurrent tumor. Yeah, it's kind of fast and it's kind of weird, right? Like why is the tumor only growing along the edge? Like often say you do an ablation and you miss like the medial aspect or a nodule, it'll kind of grow like a ball, like a normal RCC, like a nodule, but this was growing all along the edge of the ablation cavity and then also into the wall here. Any other thoughts? I mean, if it's not, if it's not, neoplastic, then maybe it's some sort of inflammatory pseudo mass or something. Yeah. So we thought this was like really weird looking, came back really fast. Um, and so they ended up biopsying it and it came back um, basically like you're saying an inflammatory pseudo tumor. And we found this paper, this is courtesy of my colleague Molina, but um, this was out of the, I believe it's the other, the MGH or Brigham group. Oh, maybe both. Um, they, um, they noted that they basically had I think they followed about 300 of their patients, oh, 253 patients, and six of them had developed these inflammatory nodules after ablation. It happens more frequently after cryoablation than radiofrequency ablation. Um, they posited that it could be due to freezing along the needle track. So even though the, the temperature at the tip of the needle track where it's in the tumor is really, really cold, it is also pretty cold along the track, so it can actually cause kind of damage along the track. So one of the things you can see is inflammatory nodules and like a tram track appearance um, along the track. Um, they showed a couple of examples. So here was a tumor that they ablated. And then this was the inflammatory pseudo tumor that developed. Um, and typically they develop at, at least six months after the ablation, but it can be even up to several years after the ablation. So it can be kind of like a smoldering low grade kind of inflammatory process um, that then also um, diminishes over time. They biopsied all six of theirs and they all came back negative. Um, one important, this was another case where they did an ablation, I think this cryoablation, and then this was this enhancing nodule along the tract um, that then kind of diminished over time. They also biopsied this and this was just an inflammatory pseudo nodule. So just something to be aware of. Actually, in their, I think they 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 had over 300 cases that they've done with radiofrequency and cryoablation, and they've had no tract seeding of actual tumor. Um, and in this article, at least, they said there's only been one report of tract seeding. So they seem to say that um, you know this inflammatory nodule seeding is perhaps even more common than um, than tract seeding. And if you see something that you're concerned about, you should biopsy it. Don't just jump to the conclusion that it's uh, it's definitely tumor. So I, I had one of these cases too, very similar, and I'm glad you pulled that paper up, that it just showed, it showed up on its own, like two years later. Like yeah, this, that, that was like- And so it was like negative, negative, negative on every follow-up, and then all of a sudden you have this mass. Yeah, they and, said one of theirs showed up 52 months later. So it can yeah. be delayed. Yeah, and I went to buy, actually went to, actually went, went, went to open surgery by, you know, because I, I was convinced it was tumor. because There was like nothing on it before and it was all inflammatory. So that was really humbling, actually. Yeah, yeah. This was like, we biopsied this and it kind of, it like, and some of the ones when they biopsy it, it comes back organizing abscess, but with no organisms. And so it just really is like a lot of like an abscess, like a really inflammatory process. The body is like reacting to this trauma that's happened here. But um, yeah, just something to be aware of. So, okay, that's it for me. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. RT also, we have some. Oh. Um, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. Super. Okay. So what do you guys think? 
This is a great example of Hickam Stickham. Ella, can you, it, it can, hard, uh, was hard to hear. It's an exa example of what? Um, Hickam's dictum. Hickam's dictum. Dictum. <laughs> Which is the, the corollary to Occam's razor. Occam's razor yes. is like, it's all the same disease and Hickam's dictum is the patient can have as many diseases as they damn well please. You guys are killing us. Oh I think we're supposed to find multiple diagnoses here. So we have some fluid. We had some, perit there was some peritoneal nodularity or stranding. Mm -hmm. There's a descending colon cancer and a mucosal something or other coming off. Yes, right. So this patient has two uh, different uh, coexisting diagnoses. So in the uh, descending colon, there's uh, colon cancer. Um, and then in the and then there's a, a, a mucosal, um, as Cookie pointed out. Here it is, and it's ruptured. Uh, so now you have uh, sort of mixed weight content in the abdominal cavity. Okay, all right. Nice Cookie, that was fast. Can you <laughs> come work over here, please. <laughs> Give a big list. <laughs> Okay, I'm moving over to the next case. I'm trying to go faster on that, right? I'm trying to get my eyes to pick up things in like three seconds. Actually, could, uh, um, Nelly, can, can you go back? Yeah. I don't know oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me go back. Just one thing I wanted to point out um, yeah. that this is kind of just an incidental, but our, um, yeah. show me the TI. TI. Yeah, so I feel like this is a beautiful example too of like the succus bolus of the small bell going yes. into the TI. And sometimes that, sometimes you don't see it all fluid feel like that, but you just see that kind of fluid in the cecum and people will call it like a mass, like a polypoid mass. Um, see that area there? I don't know. And so, and, and sometimes on MR, you'll see it too, like this T1 mm -hmm. bright kind of mass looking thing just in the cecum. And it's basically just the recent succus bolus. So anyway, just to point out. Awesome. The second case is not a diagnostic dilemma, uh, and I have some teaching points. So this patient has, um, right, okay. like, yes, yeah, for sure, right? And it's invasive. Um, it's, it was... It, it, Right here, you can see uh, extension in the presacral space. The patient had distant metastasis as well. Um, and when I first saw this, uh, you know, it was very, the, the TT signal made me think about mucinous um, rectal cancer. Uh, this patient had, uh, the teaching point for me, it was about um, microsatellite st uh, stability. Uh, so I, I read up on that. And uh, so it's one of the prognostic features of invasive colon cancer is they look at the micro, uh, microsatellite stability. Uh, this patient had it, uh, MSS, uh, and it's a poor prognostic marker uh, compared to patients who have uh, microsatellite instability. Uh, so um, the 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 this like this patient MSS microsatellite stability is more aggressive. It like affects both sides, like the right and left colon rectum, um, and they're more likely to have positive uh, lymph nodes. For example, uh, compared to patients, a majority of the um, colon cancer are MSS um, microsatellite uh, stable. Um, in contrast, if you had MSI microsatellite instability. Uh, that's usually a good prognosticator compared to MSS. Uh, they're less likely to have lymph node metastasis at the time of diagnosis. Um, and I thought what I thought was kind of interesting was there's this paper in abdominal radiology where they looked at the radiogenomic features. Um, so the top one um, was MSI instable, um, microcellulite instable. The bottom feature is stable. Um, again, this is more aggressive. And when they kind of zoomed into the pixelation, it's more heterogeneous. And that was one of the things that they said um, was differentiating uh, from MSS. So the uh, so the MSS, the stable, microcellulite stable, they're more heterogeneous uh, when you kind of um, see the pixelation uh, compared to MSI. 
um, I guess that makes sense. You know, like we often think about heterogeneous things being a little bit not a good thing um, compared to more homogeneous uh, findings. Wait, so were you able to, to definitively say that that in this case it was um, MSS versus MSI? Or was it? Yeah, they did a pathology. Go ahead. Sorry, okay. go ahead. Oh, was it retrospectively only, or is it at the moment you read the case? Oh, no. It was um, when they do pathology, they, they um, stain for these uh, things. And I just wanted to learn more about it uh, because this was, you know, one of when, when uh, that's like one of the things that they do to sort of prognosticate the patients and figure out what to do for the patients. I, I think asking that, you know, just because it's heterogeneous, if you, I don't think we can just say this is MSR. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because tumors can do whatever they want. So uh, I bet you if you pulled 100 rectal cancers now and the heterogeneous, I don't know if that will just even equate to this is going to be MSS, this is going to be MSI. Then we don't need pathologists, to be honest. Right, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, that, that radio, that abdominal radiology paper that was looking at radiogenomics, um, I, I think that's more academic. I mean, clinically, I think it would be very hard uh, to, I mean, you know, uh, say that. Like, qu qualitatively, like that image that I showed you, the heterogene, what they saw was heterogeneous, looked a little bit more homogeneous <laughs> to me on the, the, the qualitative um, images, so. Yes, that this is where we we love our pathologist. Okay, um, uh, Nelly, so. I have a couple of points about that. So um, the other thing is that MSI is more associated with Lynch syndrome. So um, they've talked about this in our tumor board. If if they are MSI positive, they'll work them up for Lynch, which has all these other cancers associated with it, and they basically their family has to be tested. Hmm. Um, and then the other thing is that if they're MSI positive, so they'll they'll do that testing to see if they can put them on Keytruda. Um, which I think is specifically for MSI positive. Like there's certain dr drugs, it'll change which drugs they give. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Okay, so this next case is a prostate um, MR uh, and it's a, um, what do you guys think? Here's a diffusion. Pretty small uh, gland. Yes. Someone says something, but it was kind of quiet, so I didn't catch. What's up with the bladder? Yes, yes. What's wrong with the bladder? Oh, the top of the bladder, you said. <laughs> uh, no, I mean. Besides a lot of diverticula? But that T2 hypo intense stuff. Yeah, right? And the lateral wall. So the prostate was fine. Um, there was no suspicious lesion, but there was a extra prosthetic finding, um, this you know abnormal thickening that's T2 dark. Uh, it doesn't really restrict very much, um, not not a lot, maybe a little bit. I don't know, uh, but you know, it's not another one of the um, um, hickam dickum stick dickum <laughs> dictums. <laughs> so this one, dictum. Um, this so this patient, uh, even though they were looking for prostate, uh, actually turned out to have muscle invasive. Uh, bladder cancer. Um, so this went to cystic prostatectomy. There's a, a small focus of Gleason 6 prostate cancer, which is not, not a big deal. But um, so this is, you know, I, I've seen a few cases where, you know, we've done prostates um, looking for prostate cancer and then incidentally find bladder cancer instead. Nelly, was this the case I did the CTU on? Um, I don't know, but there is a CTU. Uh, two of them. Actually. I agree with uh, Christine's comment. It looks so T2 dark. I was like, I was like a little, I thought it would be either treated or something fibrotic. Did this include uh, DCE and, and did that cover any of the tissue of the bladder? Um, there is DCE. Let me see. This was I'll a pretty, uh, here, let me see if I can pull up the DCE. Oh yeah. That's a good point. Let me, let me have it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here. Uh, can you see my, I, I just got the post-processed images, but there is uh, enhancement along that right wall. Can you see my images? Yeah. 
Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. There's, there's abnormal. But enhancement. like Steve is saying, that's not super avid enhancement, right? There's enhancement, but if it was avid, it would be more, it would be more red or no. I think you're right. I mean, I don't know. We don't use color. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> and these color maps, like what, would your, the, what, what would your prostate cancer be? What color would your prostate cancer be? Um, I mean, it should be red, like you said, right? Because it like wash in, wash out. But right. In so this, this makes sense me, that the urethelial, which has low level enhancement, doesn't have that red enhancement, but it has mm -hmm. like some thickened enhancement, I guess. Yeah. Compared to the the normal left side. Uh, I mean, I would have read this as enhancement relative to the left. Yeah. I think that T2 also nicely shows it going beyond the muscle. Um, so that's, that's a good way that like MR can help you stage it. I, I totally agree. I think, oh, okay, you know, this one's even better. Let me get you this one. Um, oh no, that, that's not the one. Um, where you do see the enhancement right there. That looks pretty convincing. A little dark on my screen, but. Yeah, no, it's sorry, it's a subtraction. Yeah, I see. Uh, We're convinced. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. I'm, I'm convinced once you have the pathology, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then this other case, uh, it's a pet. Uh, GE Junction. Yeah. So what about it? What do you think? Inflammation or cancer? Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a esophageal gastric cancer. Uh, so esophageal gastric cancers are, they can be, there's a, a classification system. I, I, um, so this was, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, here it is. Can you see my, um, so there's a, when in, in our GI note, we ha, uh, they said, you know, it was like a C word three, type three. So I like looked it up because I didn't know, you know, what the C word classification was uh, for esophageal gastric cancer. Uh, so there's three types. So, so type one, so these are all um, different types of esophageal gastric cancers. So type one, uh, that's uh, felt to be like a, an esophageal cancer, kind of arising from Barrett's, for example, and that uh, extends into the cardia. Uh, type two and three, they're gastric cancers um, and that extend into the distal esophagus. Um, uh, interestingly, though, um, so, the, so it's, if it's two centimeters uh, beyond the GE junction, then it's considered type three, and that's how you differentiate two from three. Um, but these are gastric cancer. Prognostically, um, the type three do worse than type one and two. So um, these types um, do a lot worse, um, and they have poor survival rate compared to type one and type two. Um, so this case uh, was an example of a type three, according to um, our GI uh, docs. And the patient had uh, surgery and, and did very well uh, postoperatively. Um, the, uh, so the, the, the cancer, you know, it used to be five centimeters beyond the G junction, but they changed it. So the, cl the classification is now just two CM uh, beyond the uh, G junction. And um, and they find that, um, so type one and two have similar survival, even though type one is considered gastric and type, I mean, uh, type one is considered esophageal and type two is gastric. Uh, but, um, uh, and uh, type two benefit from subtotal esophagectomy, uh, not just extended gastrectomy. So there's like different surgical approach depending on which C word classification uh, they fall under. Okay. That's these, ty me. these type assignments are being assigned preoperatively by endoscopy. Is that correct? Um, I, 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 I yes. presume so. Yes. It changes even chemotherapy to chemotherapy regimens. Okay. I think they're also being assigned by us because uh, we've had to, uh, people ask us during tumor board, you know, like how far down is it extending? Where is it centered? And that kind of thing. Because sometimes if you lose the the uh, GE junction, the endoscopists don't know where they are. You know what I mean? Like they don't, they can't really like tell how far above and below they're going. Yeah, that's great. That's something that we should do. Actually, we should take it further and do that from now on. 
talk about how much of the proximal stomach appears to be involved oh, in terms yeah. of centimeters from the suspected GE junction, huh? Yeah, yeah. Where, the epi where the center of the tumor is and then how much it, it goes up into the esophagus and how much it goes down into the stomach. Okay. Um, I'll let uh, the next person share and if there's more time I can share more cases. So this is a uh, gentleman who had uh, autoimmune, or no, cryptogenic cirrhosis, and then he received a liver transplant. Um, and then a couple of years later, came back and it seemed like he developed uh, some cirrhosis in his uh, transplant liver. And he was sort of lost a little bit for, you know, for the pandemic and then came back. So this is him last summer. And he has transplant on, an, you know, we have no conscious enhanced studies. Anyway, so he came back um, uh, this past month. And now you can see he came in for something unrelated. He was short of breath and they were concerned about pee and um, just kind of threw this in as a, as a fun study. So now you can see that his liver looks much, much more heterogeneous and is enlarged. So based on this, we recommended that he gets, uh, you know, a conscious enhanced study. And this is his MR. Uh, okay, so this is a T2 and this is diffusion weighted sequences. So you can see the, the parenchyma is completely replaced by innumerable masses. And it's not a, it's not like the typical nodular appearance of the cirrhosis and, you know, a lot of these demonstrate restricted diffusion. And then we look at the contrast, you can see these are arterial and portal venous phases. And you can see that a lot of these things enhance very avidly, kind of funky appearance on the portal venous phase. And here are the two delayed phases. So any thoughts? Oh, wait. It almost reminds me of like peliosis or like some kind of vascular right. congestive process. Right. So vascular process is a good thought. It is a vascular process, but it, you know, peliosis, um, I mean, it's, I, I honestly, I've never seen one in real life. I think they don't have, they don't generally have restricted diffusion, but I, don't quote me on that. Anyway, uh, it, it did look like there's some sort of vascular situation happening. So we end up um, biopsying him and this is uh, diffuse angiosarcoma involving. The wow. Liver. So this is like maybe a, a, a year, year and a half after transplant. So they, they actually, um, they actually kind of queried, I think some, this is only partial liver transplant. So I think somebody else got um, no, that's not true, right? That, that's entirely, never mind. So there was some confusion that they thought that, that they queried the person history of the person who donated the liver and there was no, no, you know, no, no angel sarcoma situation there. So he just got really unlucky twice. I wonder if the immune suppressant leads to something like this more likely. Yeah. Uh, or the, you know, the donor, they really didn't thoroughly evaluate, you know, the autopsy that there's, you know, an underlying man or second. This is really likely donor related. Right. It'd be interesting to see if this donor also, you know, donated kidneys or something else or somebody that's, else. And, that's what and it is. The donor did donate uh, other parts and they, nobody else got it. And they, and they reviewed the donor, you know, history and no history was there. Um, yeah, so, uh, yes, that's what it did. That somebody else got another organ. Yeah, we, we had a case like this at WashU where a unfortunate uh, donor had un undiagnosed melanoma and had donated eight different or eight, you know, organs, to eight different oh God. recipients and all eight got melanoma and all, you know, that happened. Uh, even on the, if you Google it, it's, not, it's, not, it's already been written all up, um, but. Yeah, that was unfortunate case. All right, so this is a case of a woman. Um, 
you know, in her 60s, who um, developed um, weight loss, anemia, and hypercalcemia. Um, so they did a PAN scan to look for occult malignancy. So there was nothing in the chest um, and in the abdomen, um, there wasn't like that much either. I mean, it was a non-contrast, but um, then you get down to the pelvis and then there's like this structure here. Uh, it looks like cystic. And then there's like this very coarse calcification, which um, like, is it tooth-like? I don't know, maybe I'm being fooled. <laughs> Um, but you know, it doesn't have any like fat in it or anything. So we recommended an MRI. Um, we actually started off with the ultrasound, but that was not helpful, unfortunately. Um, so Sorry, the, what, what was the original presentation for the perineoplastic component? Um, weight loss, uh, oh. anemia and hypercalcemia. Okay. Yeah. She was, are you thinking about an NMDA receptor encephalitis? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah like, actually, that's, yeah, I, I think a lot of the radiologists don't know about that entity. And I think it's something that I'm going to probably make it as a cookie jar, to be honest. Yeah. So then we got this MR and on first glance, I was thinking, gosh, could this be a teratoma? But, um, and then I thought, Okay, let's look at the T2 fat sad. <laughs> um, so on the T2 fat sad, it, it doesn't suppress. Um, so I guess it's more fluid signal. And so then I was thinking, is this a mass that's associated with the rectum? Like, should I be giving the rec you know, retrorectal cystic lesion differential? But then I think this lesion is actually separate from the rectum. Um, all together. So it looks like it's a bilobed mass. And then like one part of it is T2 bright. And then the more central part is like T2 dark. Um, and then just to show you again that, um, you know, I, I think this mass it, is totally is separate. separate from is separated from the uterus? I'm yeah. So that was my other thing too, is that could it be like a really weird looking pedunculated fibroid and then like, Can you show sagittal? Sure, sure. And then oh, just to know, like the ovaries are totally separate from this area. Um, so the sagittal is here. Looks like it might have a point of contact with the uterus. Yeah, it looks like it's... Like right here, right? Like it looks like it's maybe, like here, it's kind of touching the uterus and then, and then you get to like this yeah. thing here. So is it just like a weird pedunculated fibroid with like maybe cystic de degeneration of uh, like just one very well circumscribed part of it. Um, I just don't know what else it could be. I mean, on, on, that, on that, it looks like there's a, a bridge. I would just confirm on every single, you know, on your sagittal, your coronal, it looks like that's just. Okay. A weird degenerating fight right there, right? right like right, right there, there, right? I don't know, keep going back right there. Maybe. Okay. That's your bridge. It's almost though like she's got a pedunculated degenerating one off of a enhancing right. or a component of it. <laughs> oh, no. But yeah, maybe it's like some kind of dumbbell fibroid that yeah, it looks weird. Yeah, I really wanted this case to be a teratoma case because that would go really well with like, you know, perineoplastic syndrome, but I, I think I'm it just this is not a tooth <laughs> and there's no fat. I guess I googled and I, I I think you can get it says um mature cystic ovarian teratoma without intracystic fat it's yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I don't think it's I don't think yeah. it's, it doesn't exclude I mean I, when I first saw it I totally agreed with you I thought that looked like a tooth or you know some something that you would see in a dermoid and I don't think lack of fat it, it doesn't exclude a dermoid mm. well it's, it's separate from the nexa so it's it's not a dermoid it's attached to that structure that's attached to the uterus. So it's uterine origin, but you're correct. You don't need fat to diagnose. The other um, thing is you don't need bulk fat. So um, you have to yeah. look at the in and outs and see if there's intravoxel or microscopic fat too. Oh, yeah. Wait, sorry. Good. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Cookie, what did you say? So it's not attached to the ovary. So it's not a dermoid, but it like. Uh, uh, dermoids are adnexal, right? Yeah. I mean, you can have, you can have mesenteric, but if you're going to call it a dermoid, it has to be associated with the, the nexa. 
Oh, gotcha. So how would you classify this? I would just call this a gen degenerating fibroid. Oh, it's gotcha. Because it's attached to the fibroid, which is attached to the uterus. Another thing I was thinking when I was thinking more along the lines of teratoma is like, um, like a perirectal uh, teratoma, I guess. Is, but that would be weird, right, for this? I mean, I guess, I guess you're, you're going to have to just decide on your own. If you think it's attached to uterus, then it's uterine. Right, there's, right, right. There's right. no diff at that point. Yeah, yeah. So this is the in phase and then out of phase. Okay, guess not. Sir, did you show the DWI? Sure, I can, yeah. So it's, I guess it's this right here. Restricting, no? Or do you have the ADC? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this was done at um, like a, our satellite place. Um, the quality is not always great. And oh, I guess they didn't give us an ADC. That would have been helpful. Yeah, sorry. I don't, I don't think they sent us an ADC for this, but I'll ask for it. Cookie's not worried about it. <laughs> so I think we should, we okay. should uh, call it a degenerating pedunculated fibroid. Um, I do have a comment about the fat thing and um, dermoid. We had a case where the, it was there was only in, uh, microscopic fat detected on the first time around, and we did not call it a dermoid that time. And then um, the patient actually had symptoms of NMDA receptor encephalitis. They were looking for a dermoid. We didn't call it. And then they came back. And then at that point, it, it looked more like macroscopic fat. So it was almost like the percentage of the fat content tipped over the edge and then um, became looking more like what we call bulk fat. So um, I think you can have either micro or macroscopic fat in it, and you should be carefully careful looking for those, um, especially in, we've had like several cases where they asked us to do pelvic MRI in a clinical setting of N NMDA receptor encephalitis, and we did find a dermoid. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean there, uh, there's so many cystic dermoids without fat. So let's clarify that. You can get true cystic dermoids with no fat. That's, that's, you can have that. So, yeah. And, really, and some of the fat is like bulk fat, like actual adipocytes. And some of it is just like sebaceous material that has lipid material in it. That would, that would be microscopic fat too. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you can have dermoids without micro or macro scopic fat, period. You can have true cystic dermoids mm -hmm. by pathology. Um, and I have several cases, and, you know, um, so that's, that's a, that's actually one of the entities you think they can have by pathology. Cookie, I have a question for that. If you have like a cystic lesion in the ovary then, and it has like a coarse calcification, how do you know it's not just like some hemorrhagic cyst with dystrophic calcification versus a cystic dermoid? You don't until you resect it. But I mean, I, I, I can assure you, you can have complete cystic. Yeah. Yeah, so, now I'm just like, but then maybe it's just based on size, right? That you would resect it or not resect it. Well, or if, or if you're worried about it or, you know, things like that. Because um, even if this was a dermoid, it doesn't necessarily need to be resected, right? Like if you had like a three centimeter it, dermoid, it doesn't have to be resected. Yeah, I, I, well, I don't know how old, the old, the old this patient is. I mean, this doesn't look like a healthy patient by her MRI looking <laughs> 66. Yeah. I guess my underlying question is not all dermoids need to be resected, right? I, I, or I thought like basically only larger ones that cause, you know, like potential t risk of torsion, like they don't need to be resected just from their l very low risk of malignant degeneration. Like yeah, we have I, dermoids I, I, where we just I, wash I, them. I, I don't know the literature on that in, in the postmenopausal uh, patients if they sit on them. I don't think they sit on them here at Mayo. So I don't, but I don't know the literature behind that on a, on a postmenopausal woman. For what about a premenopausal? Yeah, premenopausal, I think you go with the size, uh, you know, for the risk of torsion. Okay. All right, thanks guys. Quick one to share. Great. Uh, let me. Steve, so this... since, since we last talked, Laura came to visit me. Oh, cool. Yeah. 
And she gave our um, residents and our wellness committee uh, mindfulness lessons. That's her bag. Okay, so uh, this is kind of like an imager's diagnosis, I guess, or an imager's differential. This patient was imaged three times. Earliest was like, you know, uh, about seven, six or seven months before the MRI, but it's basically showing the same finding. And it's a 40 some year old female that presented to the GI service with some basically just um, lipomatosis. Yeah. Fatty but she, replacement of the pancreas. Right. But um, it's, it's kind of bizarre that she's only, she's not CF or any other met metabolic syndrome, and she's only like early 40s. And I, I gave it a different, like my, I was the, the earlier CT read and I gave it kind of a differential, which I didn't really know what I was talking about. But then subsequent to that, when she had the, the next CT and then the MRI, uh, another uh, diagnosis was postulated, one that I wasn't familiar with. So I thought I'd share that with you. It's called lipomatous pseudohypertrophy of the pancreas. Lipomatous pseudohypertrophy of the pancreas. Because it does kind of look like the pancreas bed is a little bit plump, and yet the plumpness is due to adipose and not a plump pancreas. And uh, they are treating the patient for exocrine pancreas insufficiency, which is um, somewhat effective at improving the symptoms. You guys still there? Yeah, no, we're just listening. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a, I mean, there's a Schwachman diamond, right? That, that yeah, usually like it's diagnosing kids. It's, you know, right. This is, not, this is not Schwachman diamond and it's not CF. It's, uh, I mean, I can, let me see if I can find a. Yeah, no, I, I like the pseudo So here's, oh. an here's an example that was in, this was, this was written up as a case because they resected it. <laughs> and it was it was more localized to to the head, so that this person had kind of a, a body and tail that was sort of intact, and then it was all happening just at the head. Uh, but if you look at other cases, like if you Google pseudo hypertrophy, like pulmonary pseudo hypertrophy, you get a bunch of cases that look like this. And they're all case reports. Cool, and, and you don't know what causes it. No, it's rare, idiopathic and they just basically treat the exocrine deficiency. There's no endocrine deficiency. So somewhere in here, there's islet cells and, and the skeleton of the pancreatic ductal system is still there too, apparently. Yeah, I just Googled it and it said usually that the islets are preserved, which is yep. kind of crazy. It's almost like somehow only the exocrine cells are being attacked. Right. That's cool. So I just thought I'd share with you, uh, what was for me this year, a new diagnosis that I wasn't aware of. When they resected that head, um, was there any normal pink red cells or is that, it was all fat? I, I have to confess, I didn't study the, the article that I just showed you <laughs> yet. Because I, I, when you say hypertrophy, I mean, does it, does it just push the other cells away and, or is it like replacing it? I mean, that's, yeah, like, that's I, interesting. I think, yeah, I think, it's it's proliferative. So the 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 exocrine glandular part of the pancreas is substituted by adipose that's somewhat proliferative in character. And I don't know if that proliferation is if it's autoimmune or or what. I mean, but it sounds uh, cookie. It sounds like the islets are preserved. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um. Enlargement and increased weight of the pancreas, morphological, uh, complete replacement of pancreas, exocrine tissue by fatty tissue with sparing of the duct and the islets. It's a weird diagnosis and it's rare. So uh, maybe you'll never see it, but I did. <laughs> like, radiologists see rare diagnoses, don't we? Very cool. All right, that's, that's all I had for today. I'll stop sharing.
I have another case if there's time, but I think we're hitting at the top of the hour. I think you can do it quickly. Uh, okay. If Unless you want to save it, whatever you want. It doesn't matter. I can go either way. Go for it. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is a patient's, uh, what do you guys think? Liver transplant evaluation. The background liver looks erotic. Mm -hmm. And we have an arterial enhancing lesion that has like rim affy with fill in. Mm -hmm. T2. T2, let me get it for you. And DWI would be helpful. Okay. So here's the DWI. Uh, looks like it's restricting. And then the T2 is right here. It's very bright. That's like hemangioma bright. Maybe it's a goofy hemangioma. No, wait, hold on. Yeah, it's all right. Um, it's not a hemangioma. Huh. Where's my arterial? Enhancement pattern is my least favorite way of characterizing a hemangioma. Yeah, because you can AFP. You can have atypical hemangiomas that look like this, but I guess if you have a background of cirrhosis, you have to. Is it neuroendocrine? Um, this one um, path came back to be a biphenotypic HDC huh. uh, cholangio. Uh, so. Wait, that. Yeah, that T2 I is crazy. That. Yeah. Yeah, that T2 is crazy, actually. <laughs> um, but it's path proven. Um, we had given it an fail. LRM. What? <laughs> I think I would have failed. Um, I like the LRM. Yeah, it was an LRM. It was an LRM. We called it prospectively. Um, so I just, um, th there's a study that looked at, um, Theodora is at Rochester, uh, looked at uh, Lyrats, uh, for in patients with biphenotypic uh, mixed cholangio HCC. And they found that half of the patients had qualified for LR5 lesions. Uh, and so um, they looked at features that separated uh, kind of biphenotypic from, you know, our, our more typical lyrets. And one of the things, or a few things that uh, was identified was the rim peripheral arterial phase enhancement, um, like Arthi mentioned. Uh, and then there's portal and delayed phase progressive central enhancement. I guess something that we, you know, someone said, I think also Arthi said, uh, marked restricted diffusion. Um, and uh, so I, this patient, I think, had first one, second one. I think it was pretty restricting. Um, third one. So when you see these features, uh, these ancillary features, then I think LRM is something that we should definitely consider. Uh, but, you know, note that these, you know, half of them um, meet LR5 criteria. So I think it's important to be mindful of these ancillary features that uh, will make us lean more into a biphenotypic um, cholangio, hepatical cholangio um, cancer. And uh, that's important because prognostically these patients do worse uh, than patients who have just conventional HCC. I think that... Um the non-RIM and the fill-in and everything, we would have all said LRM, but that T2 is just kind of crazy. So that's good to know that it can just be so bright like that, even though it's really enhancing. Yes. Steve and I have learned. I have, I always <laughs> learn. Good case today, thanks. Okay, thanks guys, bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye.